Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting the biggest hint yet at who might be Donald Trump's vice presidential pick. I have to bring you this new intel coming in. There's still some other names out there. We're going to discuss. We're going to debate. I know you guys have your point of view. Anyway, Tim Scott dropping the biggest hint just yet about whether or not he's going to be the guy. Plus, we got Letitia James out there. She's still circling. I mean, this woman, she's a dog with a bone and she just won't give up. We know why. Politics, politics, politics. We need to discuss that. Plus, Michael Avenatti. I mean, when Michael Avenatti is telling you game over, I think it's game over. He's calling him from prison. He's telling the MSNBC anchor, this is fantastic. I can't wait to show you this. But you know what? There's no there there. In other words, the hush money case, it kind of jumped the shark. It's eight years old. It had its day in the sun, and that's not now. We're going to get to all of that. Plus, plus, some really interesting develops there, developments there on Capitol Hill vis-a-vis a couple of reporters who really feel as though their network, their network, notice big network, stifled their freedom of speech and they wound up actually losing their positions because of it. We'll get to everything plus OJ Simpson, dead at the age of 76. Hear Caitlyn Jenner's reaction. Welcome. Welcome back to the show. I'm Trish. This is the Trish Regan Show. We are live. So I'm looking at your comments here in real time. I welcome you all back. If you haven't subscribed, do me the favor, subscribe, hit the like, share, all that good stuff because I'm here every single day for you, for you fighting the battle. We're doing it together and we're growing, 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 which is wonderful. Okay, beginning today on who is going to be the vice presidential pick for Donald Trump. He's been going around in circles about this. You know, he's kind of leaked a few hints here and there. He was asked directly by Fox News about Tim Scott saying, hey, you know, what do you think of Tim? And he said, Tim's great. And then he pivoted. He said, you know what? It's not that big a deal, guys. You kind of are getting a little too excited over the whole VP thing. The person that I pick, I don't think will surprise anyone. I've also heard internally from my sources, he's not obsessed with the idea of, oh, I've got to go with somebody who checks a box. In fact, he's the antithesis of that. He actually just wants to go with the person who can actually get the job done and help deliver the finish line. But Tim Scott has certainly been excellent, as he has pointed out, at sounding the rallying cry for him over and over again with crowds really speaking to the base and getting the base excited about Donald Trump. But is the base enough? Well, it's a question we can debate. But I first want you to hear this little bit of intel that Tim Scott dropped on the situation, going on Hannity's show, Hannity's pretty close to Trump, and having this to say when asked point blank, are you going to be the VP? All right. Let me ask you this. Based on tonight's report, have you had any conversation with President Trump about potentially being and running as his vice president? And if you are asked, what would you say? There's no doubt that President Trump will make that decision, I believe, before the convention. I have not had any specific conversation with the president. I can tell you one thing. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes for President Donald Trump to have four more years, whatever it takes to restore sanity in the streets of America, count me in, Sean. You're a patriot. I'm a patriot. I love America. I'm not possible in any other country on the planet except for the city on the hill. That's America. All right. The shine. <laughs> all right. He made it very clear that he's all in. I, I would take that as a yes. Would you not take that as a yes? In other words, if he is asked, he will meet that opportunity. He's ready for the job. He wants to do whatever it takes to help this country, to help Donald Trump win another four years. So put Tim Scott in the yes column. He wants the gig. Who else is out there, though? You know, I've mentioned a few sort of off the beaten track names. You know how much I like Byron Donald down in uh, Florida, right? We've talked about Byron a lot, and Byron's been on the show his only problem is he's from Florida, and so it creates, and Don will tell you this if he's in the chat right now, it creates kind of some issues in that you're not as likely to lock up some of those votes elsewhere. Nevada, that's very much in play, and he could use those electoral votes out in Nevada. So Ms. Nome, the Governor Nome, Governor Nome out in Nevada, she might be... Um, she might be a possibility, um, sort, sort of that part of the country might be relevant. You've also got other contenders like New York, right? That's a lot of electoral votes that you could be talking about in New York. And there's a, a former congressman there who I think might be actually up 
potentially in the running. I mean, a lot of different people, and I have a feeling this is like The Apprentice, right? He's just going to actually keep this thing going and going and going as long as he can. And why would he do that? Why would he do that? Well, it helps to create more and more attention. And he can say, gee, I'm kind of surprised by you guys. I'm sort of surprised that you would ever, ever, and forgive me, I meant South Dakota. <laughs> you know, you take one day off and what happens? Kirsty Nome, of course, being from South Dakota. You know, you, you, you need, um, you need, you need the attention around this, but you know, he's got all the attention, frankly, I think that he could possibly, possibly need. And that's in part because we're going into yet again, another, another suit, another, you know, this one actually starting on April 15th, no matter how many tries he's had, he can't seem to stop this one. And it's very politically motivated. So we have a new trial coming forth, um, new, I mean, he, he's tried to stop it 11 times, I believe. Yeah, 11 times he's tried to stop this one. I thought he would have had a chance because you get such a biased judge. This is the hush money case. It's hard to keep track of him, right? I mean, you got 91 counts against the guy. You get four criminal charges. Well, this one, this criminal case is going to court April 15th. He's going to be spending four out of five days in court. And the Democrats think this will help them. I think it's actually going to backfire spectacularly. But one one thing that kind of caught me by surprise, and I have to share with you, is the reaction of Michael Avenatti. Remember Michael Avenatti? He was the lawyer for Stormy Daniels, like the reason this whole thing is going down. You know, he was on the civil side. He didn't win his case. He turned out to have all kinds of other problems, et cetera. And now he's in jail. Hmm. Tells you a little tells you a little something, right, about the people surrounding all of this. Anyway, Michael Avenatti called MSNBC from jail. And I have a feeling they thought they were going to get one point of view. And so I want you to see the anchor's face as this goes down in real time, reacting to what Michael is saying, because Avenatti is actually saying, hey, you know what? I think this case is kind of done. It's sort of over with. You had your chance. Why didn't you bring it to trial way back when? Well, we know why. We know why, because they specifically wanted him tied up so that he wouldn't be able to campaign, so that he would be in court four out of five days a week. But watch this, because I think it's uh, it's certainly funny, <laughs> if nothing else. Check out Michael. And you join us at a very newsworthy time. Uh, some of your lawyering uh, led to the exposure of the evidence in this case. Uh, the New York trial now will be Donald Trump's first and possibly only trial this year. Um, how do you assess the strength of the prosecution's case? Well, I think what I'm about to say is going to surprise a lot of people, and that is that, um, you know, I think this is the wrong case at the wrong time, Ari. Um, I, I think that the case is in many ways stale at this juncture. You're talking about conduct that occurred some eight years ago. Uh, I think the uh, fact that it's occurring in state court in New York uh, is a mistake. Uh, and I think that when you are going to uh, potentially deprive tens of millions of Americans uh, of their choice for the presidency of the United States, whether we agree with those folks or not, or regardless of what we may think of Donald Trump, I think it's a mistake to do it based on a case of this nature. Hmm. Um, I, I was hoping, frankly, that uh, there would have been less hand-wringing, uh, less bedwetting, and that the January 6th case would have been filed in a more timely manner. There's no excuse or reason as to why that case could not have been brought in 2021, and it should have been brought in 2021. And had it been brought in 2021, we would not find ourselves in the situation that we're in right now. Now, I know a lot of people have been critical of the United States Supreme Court and uh, as well as the second, uh, not the second, but the D.C. Circuit. Yep. You know, I, I think those complaints are frankly misplaced. Wow. Wow. Did you just see the look on Ari's face, the anchor there? I think that's his name. He's just like deer in the headlights, right? Oh, my gosh. Is Michael Avenatti really saying this? Yeah, he's really saying this because you know what? He's right. It should have been brought back in 2021. That was the opportunity. But nobody wanted to do that because you understand who these people are, right? They're such political animals. Look at Judge Mershon. 
I'm sorry, but the gag order stuff, this is just bonkers, ladies and gentlemen. His own daughter has a career earning money for the Democrat Party. I mean, her clients include the likes of Adam Schiff. $93 million has passed through her company. She gets a portion of that, for goodness sakes. His daughter profits from this. She's got her clients sending out emails for money grabs, looking for more money because of these cases. So every time there's a development in her dad's case, she sends out another email looking for more money. How is that possibly ever right? I mean, from an ethics standpoint, you know, Chinese wall that you need to have at home. I'm all for the daughter working. Look, you know what? She's a grown adult. She can do her thing, but he's a grown adult too. And he needs to actually sit this one out. So I told you about this. I told you about this just the other day. It was the 11th hour. It was breaking news. And Trump's team went and said, look, this judge needs to recuse himself or you need to switch venues here. And they wouldn't allow for a new venue. And that's related to the jury pool, because how the heck are you going to get a fair jury pool on the likes of Manhattan, right? I mean, when you deal with New York City, you've got an overwhelming Democrat base there that really despises Donald Trump. So that's one issue. The other issue is the perceived, and I don't even care, you could tell me the guy's the fairest guy in the entire world, but it's the perception of not having any real divide between himself and his daughter's livelihood. She's profiting literally off of this very trial. So it's just so fundamentally wrong. And yet these people, we know who they are because consider the, consider the case that just went down, right? That's being appealed right now where you had to pay nearly $200 billion in a bond payment. I mean, that's like, that's like nothing compared to the original 500 billion nearly that Letitia James wanted because he made a deal with a bank and the bank, Deutsche Bank, lent him money based on some information he provided regarding the valuation of his real estate portfolio. And then in comes Letitia James saying, you know what? We don't agree with that valuation. So even though he paid the bank back, even though the bank totally signed off on it and agreed with the valuation at the time, Letitia comes in and says, no, 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 this isn't right. Well, now she's circling the wagons, trying to get them on something else. Here's a news story that just broke in Business Insider. Take a look at this headline, ladies and gentlemen. Letitia James is not done with Donald Trump. Now she wants evidence or wants to know if he withheld evidence in her fraud case. I mean, come on, lady. We know what this is about, okay? And it's really kind of sickening. And you're not getting anywhere with it. The idea that you would actually charge anyone a 500, I mean, that's the judge though. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta at least, you know, credit where credit's due. You got a, a lousy prosecutor and you get a lousy judge, both of whom are so politically motivated. They somehow think they're gonna come in between a bank and who the bank is lending to. Think of what that means for everyone in this country. If suddenly your transactions are not private between you and your bank, if suddenly the government can come in. Now, I'm not saying you lie on the application. I'm not saying that you inflate square footage. That's not necessarily the right thing to do. But you think that in this case, the so-called crime actually justifies a $500 million, so like a half a billion dollars worth of a bond payment? I don't think so. And, you know, he got that knocked down, but it's still insane. It's totally crazy. But she's trying to put him out of business and behind bars forever. She's made it really clear. Let's listen. Letitia James, if you can stand it. President of the United States has complained that I'm engaging in some sort of political witch hunt, that I've got some personal vendetta against him, that I campaigned against him. That is not true. It's she did. president who sits in the White House. That's president because he's not my president. He's an illegitimate president. His days are numbered. We've got to get ready to mobilize and we've got to get ready to agitate and irritate until victory is won, but more importantly, until Trump is defeated. We will all rise up and resist this man and ultimately will bring him down. This illegitimate president, I'm going to give you the same level of respect that you gave President Obama, and that is absolutely no respect at all. Donald Trump has got to go. Hey, hey. Oh, oh. Donald Trump has got to go. Okay, so you get the point, right? This woman has had a vendetta against him. She has 
in fact, campaigned aggressively against him. And all she's trying to do is find more and more and more stuff. Gosh, she must be kind of annoyed. She must be kind of mad that it turns out she's not getting her day in court the way she wanted just yet. Well, he appealed that, right? So she's got to be like, ah, oh, gosh darn it. I wanted to get him. I really wanted to get him. I wanted him to declare bankruptcy. I want to go out there. She's still trying to find a way, per this new Business Insider report, of finding a way to somehow still confiscate his assets. She wants to go back at this. It, <laughs> I'm sorry, like it's already gone to the appeal court. It's already gone there. And that's where it needs to stay, which by the way, I don't know how this whole other thing really and truly moves forward there with Judge Marchand and the $93 million that his daughter has been able to raise off of these cases. I mean, it's legitimate that he's filing for appeal saying, hey, wait a second, why, why am I being tried in this particular venue with this particular judge? And making matters worse, why am I being charged when I should have immunity? If nobody's ruled on immunity just yet, then why are any of these other things happening? We know why they're happening, ladies and gentlemen. They're trying to take them down. And it's not going to work. In fact, if anything, and we've seen this poll after poll after poll after poll, every single time they try and knock them down. We saw it with Fannie Willis. We saw it with Letitia James. And we're going to see it right now with Judge Mershon. What you're going to see is that he will rise again and people actually rally around him because they're like, hey, it could happen to him. He's the former president. This is historic, by the way, never happened in history before. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. And they start getting really worried. They don't fundamentally trust the government. And this is why you see him start to rally in the polls, including with some unusual groups, Hispanics, African-Americans. You know, we're waiting on women. At some point, I think women are going to look at this and say, hmm, but here's a woman, a black woman down in Georgia. This is just great. Donald Trump goes into a Chick-fil-A. I like Chick-fil-A a lot, by the way. You know, the fried chicken strips and the milkshakes, pretty good. Um, he goes in down in Georgia and he, he orders milkshakes for everyone. Like he gets milkshakes for the entire crowd. I can't see Biden doing this. I just can't see it. He's usually there with his own little ice cream cone, which he keeps to himself funny, right? Because Democrats are all about the giveaway, the giveaway, the giveaway. And yet his Donald Trump was like, milkshakes for all. So he goes into the milkshake bar, Chick-fil-A down in Georgia. And you get to see this. He just takes over the place. And this is just a wonderful clip. It's a woman and just saying, listen, do not believe what the media says about us, referring to her demographic. We love you. We love you, Mr. Trump. Watch. I don't care what the media tells you, Mr. Trump. We support you. We support you, Mike. Okay, 4 p.m. We've been 4 p.m. Come here, let me give you a hug. <laughs> Really sweet, just a sweet moment. And I think showcases again, sort of the humanity that he's able to touch upon. I get it, people love him or they hate him, right? Highly polarizing. And yet when he's in a crowd, when he's on stage, he's communicating at a level that I think is just frankly, really challenging for Joe Biden. Joe Biden is not a quote unquote natural politician. I can name on one hand, some of the natural politicians. I mean, I think Bill Clinton, I know he's not necessarily somebody that, we're, we're fans of, but the guy understood politics. And he actually did like people. Maybe, maybe some people, some women, a little too much, right? But he liked people. You've got Ronald Reagan, a another great example. When you see him and you look at those old Reagan speeches, he's got a way of being very self-deprecating. He's got some humor. He's got an appeal that connects, that really does connect. Uh, the Obama, ugh. He sort of had it in a different way, not in a way that it was sort of lofty and sort of, you know, I'm better than you. But he did. I mean, I remember being the White, White House Washington Correspondents Dinner. And let me tell you, he put the Daily Show guy there to shame John Stewart because he was that much better. His timing, his punchlines. He was good in front of a crowd. I don't know about the one-on-one, -on -one, and I don't know how much he really likes people. But I'm telling you, I know Donald Trump, and I know he likes people. I can tell you, even in my own experience, interviewing him or talking to him, and, you know, he, he became uh, someone that I got to know, obviously, as I was covering this administration. And he's just a more personable kind of person. I mean, that's just who he is. I can remember doing an interview at the White House 
being there, it's, you know, fa fancy formal room. This was a very, very nice room. It was not actually the Oval Office. He took me and my team over to see the Oval Office after he told a really, really funny story about Kim Kardashian and how when Kim came into the Oval Office, she looked around. Now, it's oval, right? It's oval. Like, you can see it. You're in an Oval Office. <laughs> and she goes, well, where's the Oval Office? <laughs> and he's like, uh, Kim. You're in it. Anyway, he told the story. It was really funny. He showed me like the back area where he worked, et cetera. He just wanted to hang out. He just wanted to talk. It's like, okay, we're done with the interview. Let's, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's talk. And I think that that's just part of his nature, part of his character. And that comes through. It comes through in those big arenas and it comes through at the Chick-fil-A's. Okay. And that's what is going to help propel him. So you keep going after him in these trials look, it's not good. It wastes his resources, both time and money. And yet simultaneously, it creates the illusion of the underdog, the underdog who, by the way, did a heck of a better job with the economy than the current one. It's one of the reasons why I'm telling you guys, you need to think about all these economic issues. Do we have that graphic too of all, it's the different colored graphic. I think actually the RNC put it out, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Take a look at this. Trump versus Biden, the cost of everything. Holy moly. My gosh. Eggs up nearly 50% since he took over. I mean, this is wild. Look at the cost of airfare, of transportation, even of apparel. That one sort of shocks me because you, know, you can get cheap, cheap, cheap clothes from China and yet apparel is up 13.5%. In other words, groceries up 21.1%. This is a story that's not going away. And so people are looking back on the good old times, right? With a certain kind of nostalgia because things are bad right now. I mean, just look at the headlines. This one, this one blew me away. So I'm looking at my phone this morning and planning out the show, et cetera, as we do every day. And I go to Bloomberg and I took a screenshot of this because <laughs> Bloomberg kind of, you know, summed it up pretty well. You've got Russia destroys largest power plant in Ukraine's Kiev region. Oh, that'll do wonders for energy prices. Get ready for net gas prices to go even higher. Donald Trump did this. Biden strikes GOP weakness on abortion. U.S. sees imminent missile strike on Israel by Iran. Proxies. Oh, gosh. Bond traders are preparing for 5% yield. No rate cut world. Yikes. Okay. In other words, more and more inflation. U.S. frustration mounts as Ukrainian weapon stocks run out. And can Biden fix his Gaza mistake by November? Maybe. In other words, this is one bad world that we're in. It's really bad. And this is why I'm telling you, if you haven't, go over to join joinjcn.com. My good friends over there, they are aggressively working to try and help this president and to try and help every local community all around the country right now come up with better policy ideas because we can't live in a world where we've got a 40% increase in egg prices from administration to administration. It's just not tenable. It's not realistic. It's not what we need for our future. They care about small business owners. I'm a small business owner right now. It's one of the reasons why I like these guys so much. I get what they're trying to do. I appreciate what they're trying to do. And you can be part of this. It's kind of like a, a conservative version of the Chamber of Commerce, right? Reach out to your local leaders. Help cultivate an appreciation for all the wonderful capitalist values that have made us the success that we are as a country. It's really critical right now. They'll help you do that. So you get to know people in your local community. And if you are willing to go out and sort of speak up for these capitalist values, they'll help you do that too. So great, great group. Alfredo Ortiz runs it. He comes on the show now and then. I can't wait to have him back and he'll talk some more about it. But it's joinjcn.com. We've got inflation, inflation, inflation. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we are now in an environment where not even the mainstream media, like not even the nightly news programs, of which I've worked for two out of three, they can't even ignore it anymore. You know, I would have been there pestering them in August 2020, as I was on this show saying, inflation, inflation, inflation. And they would have said, Trish, we're not doing the inflation story because you know what? Nobody cares right now. Nobody cares. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're going to care. It's kind of like when I worked for one of the big networks back in, oh, we would have been talking 2005, 2006. And I'm like, hey, guys, we've got a major problem coming. Major, mega problem. It's a Ponzi scheme, house of cards type of thing. I was referring, of course, to the 2008 crisis that was on the way. But in 2006, nobody wanted to hear it. I, I, have, I have the ability to see these things. I don't know. I'm on the front lines every single day, and you can kind of see it. History often repeats itself. Well, here we are. Finally, finally, they're recognizing that inflation is a problem. Check out ABC News just last night. Watch. 
Tonight, Americans hoping to see the Federal Reserve cut interest rates as early as June may now have a longer wait, with inflation climbing for the third straight month. The prices is too high. The consumer price index up 3.5 percent in March from a year ago, fueled by higher costs for rent, car insurance, clothes, medical care, and gas. I used to fill it up for 35 bucks. It was a beautiful thing. And now it's now 45. 45, and sometimes it's 60 with between food and gas. Um, it's it had a big impact. At Alexandria Jones of Vintage has. Shop of in Chicago, it has. And then you go over to jumped. CBS and they had a similar story there. Look, CBS News having to admit it's a problem. Watch. For the third straight month, prices have gone up more than expected from the rising cost of car insurance and repairs. So how much you're paying at the grocery store every week? Do you know how much one of these costs? Two freaking dollars. This was $200. We supposed to skip the power bill this month so we can buy groceries or the mortgage. Before the pandemic, all of these groceries, about 30 items, cost $100 on average. Now, five years later, according to Nielsen IQ, all this costs 33% more, meaning you'd have to skip it's about bad. 10 See, in items. in other words, this is not tenable. And we knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I told you it was coming. We knew it was coming because of a series of events, including Joe Biden's ill-fated third stimulus check, including Chuck Schumer's massive stimulus proposal there that pumped billions of dollars, more frankly, trillions into our economy, combined with, of course, the money printing from the Federal Reserve. I mean, all of this has an after effect by way of inflation. And this is not sustainable. We got the new PPI wholesale prices out. So it's not just consumer prices, but producer prices that have moved up again. And you know what happens when producers have to pay more for goods? What happens? They have to charge their customers more for goods. So you have a lag effect. It means consumer prices are going up even more as we head into the election. I'll tell you, boy, oh boy, did Biden make a mistake trying to convince Jerome Powell that inflation wasn't a problem. How many times do we have to listen to Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, who used to actually sound like a decent economist until she became a political animal? How many times do we have to her say, oh no, inflation is not a big deal. Inflation, you know, it's transitory. I loved that word, transitory. They just come up with a big word and think that it won't be any big deal. Well, the ladies on The View now have to deal with inflation. They have to talk about it. And that is just, whoa, that is, that is scary to hear these people talk about inflation because they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, really, really don't know what they're talking about. And so when they start talking about the Fed or money printing or inflation, well, it gets a little dicey and a little scary to the point where they're conservative. They're so-called conservative on the panel, who's not really a conservative at all. I mean, I think she used to work for Ted Cruz. Is that right? And then she became like a never Trumper. And so now she's like really popular in the media. I don't know. I don't know her. But she, <laughs> she started basically arguing for price controls at grocery stores. And like Whoopi's sort of like, yeah, I don't think Joe can do that. She's like trying to defend Joe. But simultaneously, when the conversation starts going towards price controls, we're going right back to the 1930s and FDR, ladies and gentlemen. Take it away. Disney owned ABC's The View. What I hear when I talk to undecideds is the grocery bills are... Yes, but, who, but, but if, you like, knew, if people knew civics, they would know but that there, that's not... His, listen, gross. he doesn't... There are change. absolutely things that Biden can do to address it, and grocery prices have jumped 25% over four years. What can this he is, do? This, hang what on one, real quick. This is the reality. It's the most immediate and repetitive thing. You have to buy groceries every, every week. We so get that. We get all of that. But the, but the question is, what... What do you want him to he do? Can, because he what can, can he do? He can challenge the major grocery chains if he wants to. There are things that he can do with that. He can challenge encourage how? the Fed to do. Can he take them to court? So well, can I do in a free country? Because I would say, let her answer. Yes. No, sorry, there, there are a number of things that can be done. But to just say, I, I wash my hands, that's not my problem. You can't can afford groceries. Can he, can he take them to court? Because no, it's not a matter strategy? of taking them to court. I see what you're saying. Even, even um, as campaigning on things like that helps. Because I think also making room for immigration would be helpful here. One of the things, if you're looking towards the election if you want to grab people mm -hmm. and get them voting immigration is one of the most agreed upon but problems but here's the here's the problem he he does he goes and he takes care of what he's supposed to be taking yeah. care of which is the bridge and how to open the, hold on just just the, I don't think that's what Ron Klain was saying. He was yeah. talking about him going to ribbon but he, cutting but the he, infrastructure projects. I get he might have sounded but, toned but, up but with the But bridge. here's the thing. You know, P 
People are bitching if he does stuff. They bitch if he doesn't do stuff. Listen, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Not but I'm country. pissed off. I'll, I'll tell you Americans are spending 11% of their income on food. The most I'm an American. Years. I'm a little pissed off about having overpriced stuff. But I'll tell you what I'm really pissed off about. I'm really pissed off that people seem to think that the American citizen is a wallet where you can just get your hand in here. That's what I want to talk I want to talk about why the people in New Jersey now are facing not just getting the prices raised on the buses Congested and trains. Price, yes. No, no. This is on the Jersey side. Yeah, I know, now. but it's all oh, yeah, part yeah. of the same. But it's but the congestion pricing isn't isn't making me as nuts as I would just I just want to underscore because I think it's a fair point there's not like one box he can check and suddenly grocery prices go down that would be ridiculous to suggest but what is he is being told by advisors is you need to speak to what people are feeling you yeah. need to speak to this very real reality I, I make a lot of money I put a red onion back the other day because it was 4.99 that's ridiculous okay okay and, and by the way our thanks to newsbusters for cutting that clip Oh my gosh. I mean, that was like all over the place. There are a lot of different themes going on. And then at some point, one of them comes in and you heard her say, well, you know, maybe we could go back to immigration. As we, I don't think that's going to work for him. Inflation is what it is. And his problem is he doesn't understand basic economics. And because he doesn't understand basic economics and has frankly no appreciation for what everyday Americans are actually up against, he's going to lose on that every single day and so that one on the on the right there was was recommending that he come up with price control ideas you know tell the grocery stores hey you can't charge this much then they can't sell okay rob and i over at 76 research you know my co-founder there we've looked at this data and when you actually look at the top retailers in the united states like the costcos of the world etc what you actually find is that their profitability margins have actually been squeezed. So it's not like they're making more money in this environment. Inflation hasn't really helped them. They haven't been able to come through with more pricing power. Why? Because they're having to pay more for the cost of goods. So if you pay more for the cost of goods, it gets transferred onto the consumer. And you can only transfer so much. At some point, your margin as a producer starts to get reduced. And that's just how it works. And yet these people over there on The View, they don't understand that. And the people in our administration don't understand it. Heck, I don't even think the people at the U.S. Treasury Department understand it, frankly. Let's listen to this guy, Wally. Wally's trying to tell us how, you know, inflation is under control and coming down. I'm like, what planet are you living on, buddy? What we've seen is we've seen inflation come down over the last few years. And what we're committed to doing is doing everything we can on the, um, from the White House and from the Treasury Department to continue to press into supply chains and making sure that those work as well as possible so that supply and demand can meet. Fundamentally, the Fed, as you know, is responsible here in terms of dealing with inflation. But our goal is to do everything we can on our end. Okay. Just blame the Fed. When in doubt, blame the Fed. You know, it's not entirely a bad strategy. It's just people don't really understand or know what the Fed is. What I can tell you is that they're hoping they're at the White House and they're still saying they're, they're going to get a rate cut ahead of the election and that inflation is coming down. We know inflation is not it's not coming down. Again, we can go back to those numbers, the colorful chart that shows you how much eggs are up since this administration took over. You see that? Up nearly 50%, 49.3%. In other words, this is reality, ladies and gentlemen. If you do another rate cut, they're going to be up even higher. They're going to be up like 70%. You can't keep doing these rate cuts. That's part of the problem. And you know what? Anyone who has half a brain is going to tell you you're not getting a rate cut come May. Originally, they were anticipating that. No, 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 it's not happening. I mean, even ABC News told you it's not happening. Let's go to the Fed Fund futures chart. Here, you go over to the CME, and they look at this, and they're actually measuring how many people really think you're going to get a cut, and it's not there. Well, that's that's treasuries. They're way up as well. We're going to get to that in a second. But, Drew, if you have the CME chart, I'd love to show it to people because it's a bar chart, and it shows you like 97% of all the people that look at this market right now. Nobody actually thinks you're going to get a rate cut come May. I don't think you're going to get one at all. Not in June, not in July, not in September, not even on November 7th, 7th, two days after the election, because inflation has left the station. And that is why you see, if we go back to the Bloomberg headline there, you see that interest rates are going up. I mean, we're up over four and a half percent. 
on the 10 year treasury. You understand the cost of capital is going up because people are looking at this and there's a whole variety of things. Again, we get into this at 76 in tomorrow's report. If you have not signed up, please do me that favor. Go over to HTTP colon apostrophe, well, you know what it is, 76research.com or 76report.com. Go to that website and sign up for our report coming out tomorrow because we're getting into this. We're digging in to why gold is moving so much higher, what's going on from an inflationary standpoint, what's happening with the Federal Reserve, and then there's some ideas for investors out there, including on Disney and a few other things. So I would definitely check that out. we got a big report coming for you. But this is a problem, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, just look at gold, right? So gold is been rallying as of late up over 2300 bucks an ounce and you say how can that be well it's entire entirely related to what's going on with all this money printing and the money supply being what it is jamie diamond talked about this the other day remember in his big letter the ceo of jp morgan chase saying how untenable this is and predicting that we could have fed fund fed funds at what eight percent think about that that would be eight percent so then just imagine what your credit card rate would be. We're talking like 35% at that point or, or even higher, 38%, 40%. I mean, this is not, not a good scenario. And this is why gold is rallying. I want to show you the money supply chart. See, I can wonk out with the best of them, right? This is, this is actually from 76 report. This is going to be in the report tomorrow. Rob and I were looking at this today. And you can see gold versus the monetary base. Okay, so there is, so back in 2011, do you see gold that's in the gold section of the chart? Well, gold got all the way up to somewhere around 2200 or, or close to it, actually. It was approaching, actually not even that high. It was approaching, I think, like 1800 bucks an ounce. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, gold like had this huge high and then came down after this. Well, part of the reason back then, and I'm a long-term gold investor, so I don't even watch it like on the day-to-day -day basis, but it's important to just understand. Part of the reason why it was so high back then was because was because the monetary base was different, right? Like you only had so much money out there. Well, once you start to print, 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 print money, and you see the black the black line that's going 2020 through now, you see how high that went? Well, once you're flooding the market with that many dollars because you just have the printing presses going, well, that makes all the sense in the world then that gold would rally. And so you look at those coming in line right now and we think about the future and what it holds. I don't know how they continue to print like this and yet this is what they wanna do because no politician actually cares really and truly about the future. Heck, Joe Biden, how old is he? 81 and an old 81 at that? You know, he's going to be long gone before he has to care about what his grandkids are going to be looking at. So you've got an older class of politicians that just want to keep the spigot open as long as they can stay in office. And this is fundamentally the problem. This is one of the reasons why I continue to like gold. This is one of the reasons why I say you're going to continue to have inflationary pressures in the economy. You know, this is why we need smarter people. We need younger, smarter people. I'm telling you, we cannot continue. This is not a sustainable path with the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's and the, and the Joe Biden's of the world, all right? Like they don't care about you. They don't care in my estimation about our country. And this is a huge problem. It's one of the reasons why I am proud to support Americans for Prosperity. And I encourage you to do the same because Americans for Prosperity, they understand this. I've spent a lot of time talking with these guys and they're as wonky as me, right? Like they love this inflation stuff and, and we can talk for hours about it, but they get it. And I'm telling you, it needs to get communicated and that's what they're trying to do. So they're trying to make sure that we get politicians in DC that actually understand this stuff. I would tell you, you know, I've spoken at length with, with Donald Trump about it. He understands the fundamentals here much better than any other politician, but they wanna make sure over at americansforprosperity.org, they wanna make sure that you have not just the Oval Office, but that you get the House and you get the Senate. Because I'll tell you, you get Trump in there, if you don't have everybody else in there, then it just becomes one big giant you know what show. All right, to, to be perfectly blunt, because then it just becomes pow, 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 and they're going to fight all day long. And, you know, he enjoys a good fight. <laughs> and there are those on the left that enjoy a good fight. And that's what you're going to have happen. So we can't allow that. We need to make sure that we take it all. I'm telling you, for the sake of our future, you got to have the House, you got to have the Senate, you got to have the Oval Office, and we got to have policy that makes sense, ladies and gentlemen, because this certainly doesn't. Speaking of policy that really and truly does not make sense, I got to get to this clip 
from Catherine Herridge and, and another from Cheryl Atkinson, two wonderful reporters that I have worked with throughout my career and uh, really just exceptional, exceptional journalists. I'm going to get to that in a second. But thank you for all your nice words. I'm looking at you in real time here because this is a live show. I try to be live here as often as possible. We're live every day, every day, Monday through Friday. I did take one day off this week, but uh, I continue to feel great. I continue to feel great. And I think part of the reason is because I take something called balance of nature, balance of nature, fruits and veggies every single day. And this is critical right now, especially, you know, you're going into a time of year where there's all these um, transitions in the weather. You want to stay healthy, right? You want to stay on top of it. I know that I personally, living in the Northeast, don't get enough vitamin D and I also don't eat enough fruits. So this is where Balance of Nature comes in. And I love it. I take it every day. The fruits and veggie capsule, you can do the same thing. You can call 1-800-246-8751, 1-800-246-8751. Your discount code, make sure you use this. It helps me and it helps you. You're going to get 35% off, $10 off as well, plus free shipping. So a pretty good offer there if you're interested. If maybe you're not the best at getting all your fruits and veggies, this is one way, like me, that you can make sure you incorporate Incorporate all that stuff in. Again, balanceofnature.com. Go check out the website. Lots of wonderful testimonies, not just me. I mean, my, my music, my kid's music teacher as well. I've told you guys that story. He's like, oh, Trish, you take Balance of Nature. I've been taking it for years. I love that stuff. And I'm like, I know, I know. I love it too. I love it too. All right, turning to Capitol Hill. Catherine Herridge just coming out with a uh, really gangbuster testimony today. So Catherine Herridge was fired in a big swoop from CBS News. They actually fired a whole bunch of people. A lot of questions as to how and why this all went down. She was involved with some litigation and she was asked to give up some sources and she refused to do so. After five years there being at the network, I used to work with her at Fox and I can tell you she's an outstanding reporter. Really like one that dots the I's and crosses the T's and all that good stuff. So really, really good reporter. And she has historically done a lot of stories that are somewhat critical of the deep state, so to speak. And apparently she was working on a story and some people at CBS and the U.S. government wanted her to turn over some sources, as I understand this. And she said, no can do, because these are my sources and I'm not going to turn these people into you. And the next thing you know, she's part of this mass layoff. And a lot of people are asking, with good reason, some questions. Do we have Catherine Herridge that we can go to first? Because then I, I want to show you guys Cheryl Atkinson as well, um, who also used to work at CBS and also had some strange experiences. But let's start here first with Catherine. I was laid off in February. An incident reinforced in my mind the importance of protecting confidential sources. CBS News locked me out of the building and seized hundreds of pages of my reporting files, including confidential source information. Multiple sources said they were concerned that by working with me to expose government corruption and misconduct, they would be identified and exposed. I pushed back, and with the public support of my union, SAG-AFTRA, the records were returned. CBS's News' decision to receive my reporting records crossed a red line that I believe should never be crossed again by any media organization in the future. Wow. So she's testifying there, pushing for legislation that would ensure that reporters and their sources could be protected. This came up as well with Cheryl Atkinson, who also used to work at CBS News, and I worked with her there. And again, I just want to compliment her on her reporting. She was and is a phenomenal reporter, has a podcast herself now, and she was very very frank about some things. Well, Jim Jordan had a lot to say as well, because the circumstances by which she left CBS were, were interesting. I'll, I'll let, I'll let Drew play this clip here. The uh, rank, uh, the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Atkinson, you wrote stories critical of the Obama administration. Is that accurate? Yes, but may I point out it wasn't put in a political light and there were also stories no. that some would consider critical of the Bush administration. We'll say it this way. You wrote stories critical of the government. Yes. Yeah. And you, you, you factually reported. And then uh, you did on Fast and Furious, you did it on Benghazi and other issues. Yes. Uh, and, and even before, as you said, on the Bush administration. Um, and then strange things started happening to you, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, like your computer, you think it, your phone gets bugged, you believe, and things happen to your computer after you wrote stories critical of the government. Right. 
That's scary, right? Yeah, it's not it's a comfortable everybody. feeling, right? Ms. Harridge, you wrote stories critical of the Biden administration. Is that, is that true? That's fair. I mean, you wrote a number of things about the, the laptop issue, about Hunter Biden, all kinds of things. You wrote critical of the, the Biden family, the Biden business operation, the Biden brand, and all that stuff. Congressman, I reported out the facts of the story. You sure I, did. I you sure did. You reported the facts. And uh, then CBS fired you. Is that right? Uh, my position was terminated. Yeah. And you're an award-winning journalist. How, how long did you work at CBS? Uh, I worked at CBS News uh, for four and a half years uh, during that period. Uh, we won major awards. Uh, I was part of an Emmy-winning team. I was nominated for investigative Emmys. Um, I think the most important projects were projects that drove legislation here on the Hill that positively impacted a million veterans. So award-winning journalist, won all, won all kinds of awards, had worked there almost five years, had extensive experience at a different major network prior to that, where you were also an award-winning journalist, done all kinds of reporting critical of the government there as well and then you get fired. But it's worse than that, isn't it? Because they didn't just fire you. What else did they do? On February 13th, when I was told on a Zoom call that my employment was terminated, I was locked out of my emails and I was locked out of the office. Um, CBS News seized hundreds of pages of my reporting files, including confidential source information. And that's not normal, is it? No, that's not my experience in the other two networks that I've worked at or with my colleagues um, at CBS News. When the network of Walter Cronkite seizes your reporting files, including confidential source information, that is an attack on investigative journalism. Yes, it sure is. So I'm, just, I'm just trying to, it seems to me there's a pattern developing here. You're critical of the government, Ms. Atkinson situation, and shazam, they, they start doing all kinds of strange things to your phone line, to your computer. You're critical of the government at a major news organization, and you're award-winning journalist. You've been there five years, you get fired. But it's not just you got fired. In fact, you can, we can, we can, maybe there's nothing to that. But what we do know is they seize your documents. That's scary as well. And you talk about a chilling effect on the First Amendment. I don't know how it could be more chilling. Now, thank goodness the lady sitting beside you, they stepped in, right? Because they're stepping in and helping them stepping in help you get your, because you got your files back finally, didn't you? I did get the files back. Uh, if I didn't have the support of SAG-AFTRA really publicly standing up for journalism, I don't believe that I would have re received the files and they would have been returned. And I just want to be clear, Congressman, wherever you work, if this happened to you, it's an attack on free press. It's an attack on the First Amendment. It makes it more challenging for reporters to work in the future. That disrupts of does. the free flow of information to the public. They call it a journalism, a profession for a reason, because it's about an informed electorate and it's a cornerstone of our democracy. I can only speak for myself. When my records were seized, I felt it was a journalistic rape. Uh, Ms. Cavallaro, have you ever seen that before, where when, when someone is uh, leaving an employment at a, at a major news organization, they seize their documents? I can't say that SAG-AFTRA is familiar with every single case of termination or departure. Where I'm not asking that. I'm saying, have you ever seen anything like this? I have, I have no recollection of seeing... Well, that should scare us, too. First time it ever happened, and it happens to an award-winning journalist who's been in this profession for a number of years, known all across the profession. And that happens on the heels of what happened to Ms. Atkinson because both journalists were critical of the government. That's exactly what the, that's what journalism is about, being critical of the government when the government's doing things wrong, and then to have a major news organization or the government itself do this. In your testimony, Ms. Herod, you had a, a very important line. You said, if confidential sources are not protected, journalism is dead. And I agree, but it seemed to me if retaliation is allowed, by the government or by some major media outlet, journalism is dead as well. And that's what this hearing's about. And I, again, want to thank you all for... Pretty, pretty remarkable stuff. So Catherine Herridge lost her position and then they took all her stuff. Cheryl Atkinson, I remember this at the time. I mean, they were like sort of suggesting that she was nutty because she revealed that her computer files had been broken into by the Obama administration and her cell phone had been hacked. Well, it turned out she wasn't the only one. Jim Rosen 
who was also a reporter at Fox News at that time, said the exact same thing happened to him. So you, you see kind of a pattern. You know, I remember when Trump was in office and he would call out the likes of Jim Acosta right to his face and say something kind of nasty, like, get out of here, you don't belong, you're fake news, etc. The difference, ladies and gentlemen, between Donald Trump's approach and the Obama or the Biden administration's approach, in my estimation, is that one, being Trump, would just call you right out to your face. He'd tell you exactly what you think. It's kind of like the, the Queens-style approach, right? Queens, New York, versus the approach of going behind your back and maybe hacking into your computer or sending notes to your bosses or getting into your phone or intimidating your bosses, which, in my estimation, may have been what went down with Catherine Herridge and Cheryl Atkinson. And so that's frightening because then you're not allowed to do your job. I mean, look, you always get pushed back. You always get pushed back as, you know, I remember reporting on the Patriot Act and the Bush administration didn't like what I had to say about the Patriot Act because, of course, you know, I didn't like the Patriot Act and I might have kind of worked that in somehow as an angle in one of my stories when I was at CBS. And they sent a letter. They sent a letter to my bosses. Fortunately, my bosses didn't really do anything about it. It kind of all blew over whatever. Of course, it was a Republican administration. <laughs> um, you know, if I, if, I had, if I had chosen the same attack on a Democrat administration, I don't know if I could have promised you the same uh, upshot of the ordeal. But the point is, is that this kind of stuff happens. And what you need is an organization that's willing to stand up to power, right, and say, I'm going to protect my reporters. I'm going to protect their reporting. I'm going to protect them and their sources. And if you don't have that, then how do you speak truth to power? I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm here. It's one of the reasons why I love it here. It's one of the reasons why you can't get any more natural and real than what's going on in this environment right now, where we've been building organically, literally, viewer by viewer by viewer. You're knocking on 300,000 right now over on YouTube. And then we're live on Twitter as well. So a shout out to all you guys over there. We're live on Facebook. But really, just we've been able to build this because I think you're seeking a purity in the reporting that I so desire to be able to deliver. And this is the one place where, you know, you don't have somebody breathing down your back saying you can or cannot say something. And so I, I think Catherine will go on to have an amazing future. Cheryl already has, but this is the reality of sort of the world in which we live. Turning to another story, OJ Simpson, 76 years old, ladies and gentlemen, dead of cancer. And I want to play for you just exactly what, uh, Caitlyn Jenner had to say on the matter, but before I do, here is a video I can show you of O.J. Simpson talking about his health. I guess it would have been just from a short time ago, sort of indicating maybe that he was in okay enough health. Let's watch. Hey, X World, it's me, yours truly. Boy, what a beautiful day it is here in Las Vegas. Even though the game is indoors, it wouldn't have mattered, but still, it's nice to have a beautiful day like this. Hey, let me take a moment to say thank you to all the people who reached out to me. Uh, uh, my health is good. I mean, obviously I'm dealing with some issues, uh, but hey, I think I'm just about over it and I'll be uh, back on that golf course, hopefully in a couple of weeks. But it was very nice hearing from you and hearing those good, positive words. Thank you. Now, as far as the game goes, uh, I So he said he was in good health, sort of. Um, Obviously not. Obviously not. Uh, O.J. Simpson dead today of cancer at 76. And I want to share some clips with you of Caitlyn Jenner. So Caitlyn Jenner, of course, had been married to Kris Jenner. Kris Jenner was the, was the wife of the Kardashian lawyer, right? She used to be Kris Kardashian, and that was who represented Donald Trump, Donald Trump, O.J. Simpson, forgive me, quite uh, infamously. Jenner had uh, a reality show in 2021 in which she said, actually, that she did think that O.J. murdered Nicole and Ron. And in her autobiography, The Secrets of My Life, she said that she did not like him, adding that he was, quote, the most narcissistic, egocentric, neediest a-hole in the world of sports I had ever seen. And I had seen a lot of them. So Caitlyn Jenner tweeting out today, good riddance, OJ Simpson, clearly not a fan and a big believer that in fact, it, it did happen. I think a lot of people feel that way, right? And they proved that out in the civil case. Uh, back in a, a, another um, show that she did, she, she was quoted saying, 
when she was actually not a she. Obviously, he did it and he got away with it. And at one point, he even told Nicole, I'll kill you and get away with it because I'm O.J. Simpson. And apparently this was what Nicole then related to Chris. Kind of weird then that O.J.'s attorney was Kardashian. Anyway, Jenner also saying it was an extraordinary difficult time. Nicole was Chris's best friend, had been for a long time. I was at Nicole's house two days before the murder. Obviously, he did it and he got away with it. And at one point, he even told Nicole, here we go again with the quote, I'll kill you and get away with it because I'm OJ Simpson. And Nicole relayed that onto Chris at one point. And unfortunately, she was right. So horrible, horrible stuff. I think we can all remember, right? Like, I remember those days. I was a student at New England Conservatory in Boston. I used to have a job hostessing uh, at a restaurant, a local restaurant, and I remember the news coming over on the cable wires, right? That was when cable first started to come into existence. We can all kind of remember where we were that day. It was just one of those big moments in time, and there was a lot of concern because there would be riots, et cetera. So I think everybody was on edge, and everybody was really shocked that he got off. And that was one of those moments where people were like, gosh, you know, if you're powerful, if you have money, look at what you can do. So O.J. Simpson dead at the age of 76. Turning back again to uh, Donald Trump and to his pick for VP, I just want to go out to some of the comments. It's good to hear from you, Alphonse. Good to see you back here on the show. I was just reading one of your comments there. Johnny, welcome. Ian, good to have you. I know E. I know, Ian, you got the cup. You were telling me about the mug. So congrats on the the live free or die thing. If you guys have not subscribed to the 76 report, I'm going to put that one in here because we got that coming out tomorrow. 76reports.com will get you there with uh, a big explainer on inflation, on gold, on Disney. And also you can access, this is important, you can access our archives there where we've talked about other stock picks, which I think are really relevant to for you to know about in this inflationary era. Um, you guys like Elise Stefanik. I see that as a potential name. Elise Stefanik would be interesting, right? Because she is from New York and you heard me talk about New York as being a state that should be in play and that could be helpful for him. Um, you know, a lot of different names out there. David Pompeo, you know, that's a name that we haven't talked out a, a lot about. And Pompeo has been a pretty loyal supporter and is certainly strong on the on the international front. And so from a foreign policy standpoint, would really be interesting to watch. But there's a there's a lot. Of, you know, the, the good thing is the good thing is there are a lot of great people out there like you know, for, for all the complaints about the Republican Party not having a deep enough bench, I think that's totally bogus. I actually think there's a lot of really, really talented people out there. And they they understand the sort of changing mindset of America. And they have adapted a willingness to kind of say, to heck with the, the big establishment. And that's what's important right now. And that is a torch that needs to be carried on regardless of what happens. But I'm still going to say this. I think he's got a really, really good shot, a really good shot at winning this one, ladies and gentlemen. I think all of these trials, including the one that's about to start, we're on the eve of it effectively. It's coming up next week. I think that is actually going to help him more than hurt. We'll continue to watch these poll numbers But he's going gangbusters thus far. And every single time we see these things happen, what happens? He moves even higher in the polls. So that is my prediction. I tend to be right, dare I say. (laughs) Don't doubt me. I tend to be right on these things. Look, anything can happen. It's really important. They put all the the legal mechanisms in place. This is part of Lara Trump's big job at the RNC to make sure that there's fairness and equity in terms of the actual... Uh, the, the way that we go about all this and, and the absentee ballots, et cetera. We need to ensure that. Look, two can play this game. And she's hired somebody who's outstanding at ballot harvesting. And look, that's that's the path and direction you need to go because you need to fight fire with fire. And I have a lot of confidence in her and her team. So thumbs up to them. Thank you for being here. Make sure also it, go over to 76report.com. Also, if you haven't subscribed to my own newsletter, trishreganmedia.com, that is the place. I'm going to give you that one as well. Trish Regan Media. You can remember that, right? we got a big website coming there for you. So make sure you sign up. I think I spelled that right. It's always kind of tricky to actually type and talk at the same time, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Thank you for being here. I'll see you tomorrow.